Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. My name's Arisa, and I'm most definitely an alcoholic. Good to see you all. Um, the date of my last drink was October the 13th of 1993, and I don't know about you, but for me, that's a long time between drinks, way too long, It is what I would have said when I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, because when I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you tried to tell me that, you know, I wasn't going to be drinking, I'm thinking it's time for new friends, you know, like, that's just the girl that I was, like, um, I, I'm, I'm the classic, classic alcoholic, you know, the, the kind they talk about in the doctor's opinion, you know, the one who's restful, restless, irritable, and discontented, unless, unless I get that drink, you know, and, um, you know, I, I love step 11 and thank you for asking me to come and talk to you about step 11. You know, what I really, really believe is that steps 10 and 11 are the ones that actually catapulted me into that fourth dimension of existence. That fourth dimension, you know, is, is time, you know, it's about being able to be here now. And the reason that I picked the quote, right. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. Right. The reason I, I, I chose that one is because from the very beginning, when I walked in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, the old, old timers, they told me, they said, you know, the other meaning of AA is attitude adjustment. I got sober down in Corpus Christi, Texas, and there were some hardcore, you know, fundamentalist, you know, members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I say that with all the love and affection I can possibly muster in my heart. And they, they tossed me right into the big book and they told me that I was going to work the steps. And when I was done, I was going to work the steps. And when I was done, I was going to work the steps. And when I was done with that, I was going to work the steps. And guess what happens after that, right? That that's a circle around the triangle and that, you know, we never stop growing in understanding and effectiveness. People talk about steps 10 and 11 being maintenance steps, you know, um, I'm a grease monkey, grew up working on cars and, you know, in order to maintain something, there's a lot of effort that has to go into it, but, you know, um, it's not just like a little, a little oil change here and there. It's actually looking and, and inspecting things on a, on a regular basis and making sure that we're tuned up and, and things are going to be going right. And in our 12 and 12, it says that when uh, self-examination, prayer, and meditation are logically intertwined, we get an unshakable foundation for life. That's what I want. I want the unshakable foundation for life. But the other part of it, you know, Sam Shoemaker, who was the, um, the minister at the mission where uh, uh, Evie Thatcher was and, and Bill, you know, did a lot out of, he said, and I'm not going to get it perfectly, that the greatest of all fun is in living out the will of God. You know, what it tells me in, in the family afterwards that I have to be sure that God wants me happy, joyous, and free. That's what it says. We are sure God wants me happy, joyous, and free. That's the proper attitude. The, the family afterwards talks a lot about what our attitude needs to be. And in step 11, I found I couldn't do it unless I figured out how to make that attitude adjustment, especially the nightly review, right? The nightly review, I'd sit down and, and I felt like, okay, now it's time to really embrace the baseball bat, right? I'm going to get out the whips and I'm going to get out the chains and I'm going to go into self-flagellation and I'm thinking about the monks hitting them. So, like, this is what I thought the nightly review is, you know? And it's, it's so clear that it's not, but that was, you know, like we have a tendency, like I bring my brain to this. That's the problem. Right? The problem is, I think my experience from before I walked in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous should have any bearing on what I, you know, know about the spiritual life today. I had to, I realized I needed to throw out all those things. That very first sponsor, she told me, she said, when you get to, I don't know, you're finally teachable. So why don't you just try to forget all of this and just do what it says, right? I, I, I'd taken a lot of religion courses. Um, in college, I, I read everything I could, and uh, 
I'm, I'm chanting with the Hare Krishnas. I'm praying and meditating and doing yoga and Pilates. I can put my legs behind my head. I'm paddling up the Amazon in a little canoe and swimming with the piranhas because those are those spiritual people I can come up with, right? I mean, I am on a spiritual quest like God's lost. God's lost, right? God, it wasn't a God that was lost. It was that I, I, I didn't know how to get connected. You know, thank you for reading that, that appendix, you know, because it talks about that spiritual awakening. And I don't know about you, but I'm the girl who hits the snooze button. It's like, I don't know, the, you know, God's calling. I'm not ready to wake up. God's calling, but I'm not sure I'm ready to wake up, right? And, and I'm going to roll over and I want five more minutes and I, I don't want to give up my will. I don't want to give up my will. I, I'm a temper tantrum kind of girl. I, I, you know, like when they make the joke about how do you know when an alcoholic's trying to look, let go of something, you look for the claw marks. Like I understand that. I relate, you know, very, very deeply. You know, I think I've let go, but really I'm still manipulating it on the sides. I'm still trying to pull the strings. And if my arrangements would only stay put, you know, what steps, what step 11 really started to help me do was realize that it's not my problem. It's my problem with my problem. That actually everything is okay right here, right now. But how do you get okay with everything being okay? Right? How do you get okay with like God's will and not my will? You know, I, I like God's will when it looks like what I want, right? I, I'm willing to go to any links that I agree with, right? But what about the things I don't agree with? What about the things that seem wrong? What about when life doesn't go my way? What about when, you know, your sister marries your boyfriend, right? This doesn't, go, these things like they're going the wrong direction. You know, it's, it's funny how you feel like God loves you when he shows up or the job comes or whatever it is. It's like, oh, look at the flow. You know, like God really loves me. I must be doing something right. These were these steps, man, they work, right? But what I found is real spirituality happened for me when things went wrong, when my arrangements don't stay put. When things don't go my way, when life happens, and I've had a whole lot of life happening over the last 28 years, you know, and, and it's step 11 that has let me feel loved, let me feel cherished. When I, I looked at this with fresh eyes to have a brand new experience with it, and I go through the steps on a very regular basis, and I, I, I get a new big book also on a regular basis. If I showed you my big book, you'll see like half of it's marked up and half of it isn't because I just got it, you know, and I'm going through it again, and I want to really put that set aside prayer into my heart, right? I want to let go of everything I think I know so that I can have a brand new experience with you, with me, with God, with the steps, with the big book, because I've never been here before. This is new territory. I've never been in this day before, and I didn't know how to be present. See, that's why I drank. I need to stay really clear on what alcohol does for me, because if I don't stay clear on what alcohol does for me, I'm going to let it do to me the stuff it used to do to me, right? I've got to stay in this place of being willing to go to any links, not any links I agree with, but any links, right? And so, you know, for me, this is always going to be about alcoholism. I have alcoholism, not alcoholism. And I got to tell you, you know, I got clear mutual blank spots. And if I knew the day and the time that that clear mental blank spot was going to pop up, you know, it's like playing Russian roulette. If I know there's a, a, a bullet in the chamber, I'm going to make damn sure that I'm praying and meditating and I'm calling my sponsor and I'm getting to a meeting and I'm working with a sponsee and I'm reading sober literature. I'm going to do all of that stuff. But why is it, you know, I want to not do it because, you know, today I feel like I deserve to be safe and protected. Like that, that ego, it rebuilds so quickly. And what, you know, step 11 is about, you know, in conjunction with step 10 is keeping this ego down and opening my heart more and more and more. And that proper attitude, what I found is I can't do step 11 without step 10. If, you know, it get, it turns into the whips and change. There's a reason it says, you know, uh, uh, um, that I'm supposed to, um, you know, watch for morbid reflection, Right. No morbid reflection, but how do you stop morbid reflection? Step 10, 
I, I needed to bring step 10 into my step 11 process. You know, that what I realized is that I was in a very bad habit. I like to think bad things. When I got here, I, I had nightmares every single night. And there was a reason for that. You know, like I, I'd, I'd had a lot of bad stuff happen to me, a lot of abuse. I'd been abducted, you know, like bad, bad stuff had happened to me. And so I suffered from a lot of nightmares. And as I started really getting very disciplined about step 11, my nighttime changed, you know, and when I started looking at this nightly review as a kind and loving act, as an opportunity to see where God is in my life, to look for God's fingerprints, the ones that I missed all day, my nighttime changed so much, you know, that, 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 uh, that nightly review, I realized it really is a meditation. It's about how I learn to direct my thinking into a godly way, right? That I'm looking for the places where I could have done better. That, that all through the day, like in, in our fourth step, it says what, you know, in the in sex inventory, it says, what should we have done? Like if you'd known then what you know now, what would you do differently? That's the should, right? And that's cool. But this one says, what could I have? I'm looking for the missed opportunities. And when I see that I actually had an opportunity to hold God's hand today, and I didn't, that I missed it, you know, that I went with my will instead of God's will, I don't feel like I'm beating myself up. I actually feel that warm heart of God that's standing there saying, I'm here, and that you don't have to struggle. And that you can rest in this, right? That the easiest inventory I ever learned to take was, are you holding God's hand? When I experience fear, doubt, insecurity, resentment, any of that stuff, I know I am separated from God. And the only answer is to come back to God. And I think that's why, you know, I, I come from a long line of missionaries. And so, you know, there were a lot of things about the program that were really hard for me at first around, you know, uh, especially things like asking for God's forgiveness. Like, wait a minute. Like, how, do, how why is it like, if, if, if I can't be perfect, right? I read years ago, the spiritual person makes about 600 mistakes in a day. That's like the Pope or the Dalai Lama. We're not talking about alcoholics here. Alcoholics, like I mean, we're, we're in like spiritual kindergarten, you know what I mean? But like the Pope and the Dalai Lama, they're, they're catching 600 mistakes in a day. And I'm having trouble getting two. What's up with that? You know, like, how do I get willing to see the mistakes? Like, that's what this nightly review tried to help me, like, just realize, just like my little kids, like, when they make mistakes, I don't hate them for it. I actually think sometimes they're even adorable, you know, like, it, it's okay. And I love them no matter what. And so when I, when it says that I'm supposed to, you know, inquire what corrective measures should be taken and, and to ask for God's forgiveness, I began to realize that it was more about lack of power. It's more about lack of power. And that what I wanted to try to do is to see me through God's eyes. That if I'm asking for God's forgiveness, it's like I'm asking Ali for his car because mine's not working. My car is not working and I got to get, I got to get to school today. You know, Hey Ali, can I borrow your car? right? Hey, God, my, my forgiveness isn't working. Can I borrow yours? Because I need to see me the way God sees me. I need to see me the way I see my child, right? And all of a sudden, it's okay to switch from saying, you know, like, how, how hard it is to look at a mistake to just almost having fun with it. And like, where's Waldo? Because the mistakes are in there. And can I just be willing to be human? Am I willing to just be right-sized? Because I think that's what Alcoholics Anonymous really is asking of us, to walk shoulder to shoulder. I like to say I walk next to women with bloody knees. You know, fortunately, we're not all on our butts at the same time, but we're helping each other back up. We keep getting back up. We insist on enjoying our life, as it says in the family afterwards. You know, I'm a temper tantrum kind of girl, and I'm going to absolutely insist, no matter what's going on in my life, to find that joy, to find that freedom, you know, and again, thank you for reading that um, spiritual experience, because when I read it years ago, it dawned on me, you know, we talk about the how of the program, honesty, willingness, and honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, but that's not actually how it's, it's, it's listed in, in the spiritual experience. It's the who, 
It's the who. It's willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. It's the who of the program that has absolutely fundamentally changed my life. And I had to get with this idea of, you know, we are sure God wants us happy, joyous, and free. Like, that's the God I must insist on believing in. And when I fall asleep to that, this is the God I choose. And my willpower, bring me back, bring me back, bring me back, bring me back right and when i go to sleep feeling that kind of profound love i wake up differently i stopped having nightmares i woke up once i don't know maybe 15 20 years ago you know um and uh, my kids well it could have been it couldn't have been quite 20 years ago because my eldest was about to be 19 and i know she was born i'm not sure if my son was or not but anyway it was a long time ago and i'm having a nightmare which i don't have very many of anymore and i'm falling down an elevator shaft you know classic falling dream right but as i'm falling down i am i'm going into my meditation the meditation that i've done every day for i don't know how many years where i'm you know breathing in this very clear idea of God, right? And that as I do, see, I believe in spiritual alchemy. Alchemists Anonymous has taught me about spiritual alchemy. You know, the alchemists were trying to turn lead into gold. Here, we turn crap into gold. That's what we do really, really well, right? And so, you know, here I am, I'm breathing in God's love. And as I do that, I remember how loved I am. And all of a sudden I'm floating. I'm just floating. And because it doesn't matter what's going to happen, it matters where I am in this moment. Where are my feet? My foot, one's on the stool, one's tucked under my leg. That's where my feet are in this exact moment. That's all that matters. When I get here now, everything's okay. I can breathe through any kind of pain. I can welcome it on you know it's life on life's terms one of the most misquoted things in alcoholics anonymous is we get up to the podium we start talking about i'm going to tell you what it was like what happened and what it's like now that is not what the big book says it says what we were like what happened and what we are like now because i have changed i have had a profound spiritual experience sufficient to recover from alcoholism that's the big difference for me today and I didn't want to have a relationship with this higher power. I didn't want to have a God. I'm one of those girls who started off saying, you know, like the belligerent one, right? You know, like, okay, well, I'll take the doorknob then because I heard you're not supposed to have a doorknob, God. You know, I go to my sponsor being, you know, the little, you know, higher girl that I am, you know, like. I'll take the doorknob. And she says, darling, you know, if you want to turn your will and your life over to the care of that doorknob, at least it'll be out of the hands of an idiot. Right. And what I learned is a little bit of a sense of humor. Right. But also that it was so much more about being willing to not have the answers. She would teach me things like when you get to, I don't know, you're finally teachable. How about that? How about you don't have to have all the answers? Why don't you become a girl who has better questions? Because the only question I ever had was why, why, why me, right? Why did this happen to me? And she would say things like, why not you? If not you, who? Who are you going to give it to? Who are you going to give it to? Who do you want to give your alcoholism to, right? Who do you want to give all of the bad things that have happened to you? Who are you going to give them to? And, and, you know, when you start thinking about it like that, it begins to shift. And so, you know, I, I remember calling my sponsor years ago and um, Mark and I were talking about the fact I, I don't sleep a lot because I've got a lot of physical problems and actually laying down is the most painful thing that I do. And so sleeping is challenging for me. And I meditate almost all night long. That's what I end up doing. Right. And we would talk about like, OK, uh, you know, cease fighting, literally cease fighting anything. If I need to sleep, I guess I'm going to. You know, there's nothing I can do about that. You know, that's the free falling into God. What do you want from me? You know, I'm signing up for service today. That's what the third step is all about. And I can tell my different distance from that third step is by the number of opinions that I have, right? And I would talk to him about things like, you know, I have got these two little kids and they're really sick. Like kids like mine don't live sometimes, you know, like really they didn't used to live. My son couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He couldn't eat anything, you know, and it was challenging and, and, and trying to come into the day thinking, okay, 
um, where's the line between being responsible and being controlling? How am I supposed to figure out, you know, how I'm being God's servant versus, you know, micromanaging, right? What's the role God's actually assigning me? And so as, as I, as I started to really think about the 24 hours ahead, right? And consider my plans for the day. I began to really realize the distance between those two voices in my mind, right? That, you know, before I got sober, it would be like, you know, I can't stand myself. Well, who are those two people? It's like my ego and, and the spiritual woman inside of me, right? And the spiritual woman has got to chair the meeting. She's got to chair the meeting and she's got to ring the bell on some of those other stage characters because man, I got stage characters and it's like the chatter of a thousand monkeys in my mind. And they start as soon as the eyes pop open. And that is why, you know, my practice is to roll straight out of bed and onto my knees. You know, I got divorced today. Um, I've been happily married for, you know, almost 22 years. And I got divorced today because the only way I get to stay happily married for 22 years is to get divorced every morning from self-pity, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Because if I am married to that, I can't be married to David. And David's great, but I don't hear him and I don't see him because that the, all those stage characters start coming in. The wife who needs certain things, you know, the mother, the artist, the sister, or whoever it is, and they've all got agendas and they're all talking at the same time. And, and I, they are on me. They're on me. And so before I go anywhere, it's straight down onto my knees and I thank God for divorcing me from self-pity, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. That's before I go to the bathroom. That's before, you know, I, I get a drink, anything at all, right? And then, then I get to settle into my day. Then I get to really consider my plans for the day. And it's like, I teach people, you know, a, the way I learned to do it was write a little to-do list. Now that's my idea of what today ought to look like. Here's the way I think, you know, the world should be arranged. Hey God, what do you think of it? What do you think of it? And God always has this way of stitching love into it, right? It's always these, you know, I'm, I'm the one thinking about what needs to get done. I'm the one with the agenda. I'm the one who's thinking, you know, I, I, I got to get there and do that. And you need to see me and the ego. I mean, it's got ego, right? And then half the time, like, most of the crap I think need to happen today doesn't happen. My list today, it was an extremely different list than what ended up happening today. Thank God. Thank God. Because I'm not here to do my will today. I want to do God's, right? And that distance between, you know, really that nightly review that is the distance between the program and my program. And I want to get the, the distance between those shorter every day. And it starts with this thing in the morning. And, you know, I, for years, I heard people say, you know, like, read pages 86 through whatever, you know, and, and, and that's fine. I mean, if that works for you, that's fine. I, I don't, I don't get off on that. I don't, I don't know, you know, like, if it works for you, great. I don't know. What I do is I, I do, I do those pages. I engage in those pages. I make sure those pages are really, really in my heart. And I've turned the whole thing into a prayer. I started doing that, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And I, I, I'll share part of it with you. You know, I can share the whole thing, but it's kind of long. But there are two prayers I realized. And, you know, the first one is, you know, the before we begin. Before we begin, right? It says, you know, um, that we say these prayers, right? And so what I like to say is, God, as I think about the 24 hours ahead, I thank you for keeping me divorced from self-pity, dishonesty, and self-seeking motives so I can employ my mental faculties with assurance for I know you gave me my brain to use. Thank you for directing my thinking and for placing my thought life on a much higher plane and for clearing my mind of wrong motives. Thank you for inspiration, intuitive thoughts and decisions and for your continuous help. Thank you for relaxing me and showing me how to take it easy all through this day. Thank you for giving me the right answers by divine right and for removing my desire to struggle. Thank you for aligning my thinking to the plane of inspiration and making it reliable. God, thank you for patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. 
Thank you for power, for strength and direction to care for your kids and myself, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Thank you for keeping me impeccable with my words so I don't make assumptions and take things personally. Thank you for the power to always do my best. Thank you for giving me good constitution and a good disposition and horse sense. Thank you for giving me a servant's heart today. Thank you for granting me total absence of pride and the need to be right. Thank you for acceptance of the world as you created it and the willingness to bring harmony everywhere. Thank you for letting me smile and be grateful for the pain that has opened my eyes so my real humility can light my path ahead. And that's the upon awakening part that I say. And I, I, I ended it with that, that pain piece because I have a lot of physical pain, like I said, and I am so grateful today for that physical pain that I've had, because it's what got me praying and meditating at the level that I was when my kids were little and all this stuff was going on. I I started getting up at 5am, no matter what 5am, I get up at the same time every day or earlier, right? Every day. And I've been doing that now for Well, Darlie's 19. So, you know, 19 years of getting up at 5 a.m. no matter what, right? And I would have these two hours to spend with God because what I found out is that if I don't do that, you know, I don't like me. I don't like me because the kids are up and it's on and I've got to be for them and I've got to be in that circle around the triangle. If I'm just trying to give, 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 I end up feeling like that well has been completely depleted. And so I get up in the morning, you know, and you know, shame on us for, for poo-pooing newcomers about pink clouds. You know, I got I, I to take a little sidebar and say that, you know, like, you know, when they're all happy, joyous and free, and we're like, ah, you're just on a pink cloud. But you know what I realized as I'm getting up at 5 a.m. every day for almost the last 20 years, pink clouds are real. They are real. They happen every morning and every night, but the only people who experience them are the ones who get off their duffs and go out and embrace them. They are real. They are real. God gives them to us every morning and every night. Am I going to miss it? You know, I'm the girl who, who I could easily miss my life. I can be asleep to so much love in my life, but it's there. You know, the only people who get to have these things are the ones who open their hearts and open their minds. You know, Emmett Fox is the one I, I read years ago. You know, he, he was talking about coming to the United States from the UK and, and he's sitting in a cafeteria, right? And all these people have all this wonderful food. And like, where the heck's my food? How come nobody's bringing me anything? Because he's never seen a cafeteria. You know, life is just like this banquet. And it's my job to get up and go put what I want on my plate. You know, if I'm not, if I don't like what life is giving me, I need to get in the game. I need to take it, you know, more action. You know, I, I hear a lot of times in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous, things like, you know, expectations or premeditated resentment. It does not say that in my big book. Maybe it says it in yours, but it does not say that in my big book. My big book tells me to expect miracles. That's what my big book tells me. My big book tells me that there is nothing that God cannot convert into an asset. There is nothing that cannot become one of the best pieces of me. You know, like the worst things in my life have become the greatest things of my life. You know, walking through that stuff with my kids, you know, when I I, I got my daughter didn't, you know, she stopped breathing twice before I got her home from the hospital. She's pooping blood. You know, I mean, she is not well. And I got to tell you, never once did I think, why did God give me a sick kid? No, I was fortunate to be about, you know, what was I? Maybe 10. I don't know. I can't do the math. Anyway, you're sober. And, and, you know, what I knew was that God had given her a mother that was willing to stop and do everything that was needed to take care of her, that I got the opportunity to be her mother. You see, it's not my problem today. It's my problem with my problem, you know, and it says again in the family afterwards that I'm supposed to avoid then the deliberate manufacture of misery. But when problems come, I'm supposed to cheerfully let God demonstrate his omnipotence through me. Right. And how do you do that? I got to get up every morning and I got to set my intention because you can't go where you don't aim. You know, if I'm if if I'm sailing a, a ship from England and I want to get to Boston, you know, all along the way too, I better be checking my course, right? Because if you get just one degree off, you're going to a different place. You're going to a different place. And so all through the 
day, you know, like making sure that God is really with me. You know, I've got touchstones all over my life. It started off, you know, my sponsor taught me to do that. And she explained to me that touchstones were these things like people used to actually carry stones in their pockets because we pay with coins, right? And they put a little pebble in their pocket and they reach in and they feel a little, little stone and they'd be like, oh God, hey, put up and like God guy, you know, like maybe I should say, hey, to like, God guy, you know, like, and, and she told me to pray, to be reminded, to pray, pray, to be reminded, to pray, you know, and, and, you know, even on this upon awakening, as I'm covering my plans for the day, like, where is God? Where is God? Am I being intentional? Because this is about conscious contact. And I want God to be making contact with me. That's how selfish and self-centered I am. Why isn't God reaching out and, you know, making sure there's skywriting going on? I need the skywriting God, you know, like that's not my experience. I didn't have a whole lot of skywriting. You know, I really had the one of the educational variety. By that, I mean the two by four to the back of the head, you know, like the spiritual two by four to the back of the head. It's like, uh, you know, I'm a girl who learns through her mistakes and I'm not afraid of mistakes anymore. Because I was taught, you know, hey, if you do this, you're going to learn something. And if you do that, you're going to learn something. There are no big mistakes in spiritual living anymore. You know, like maybe if, maybe if I had to do it over again, I would have done something differently. But you know what? If door number one doesn't work out, how about door number two? And can I do that cheerfully? Can I welcome, you know, what about when people don't like me? Well, you know, can I take this attitude of what are they right about? You know what? Because what are they right about? Sometimes they're right. We don't like it when they're right. But what if I'm actually willing to see me through your eyes? One of the best prayers I learned to do in the morning was to ask God to let me be treated today the way I treated you yesterday and to really let me see myself the way you see me, right? Because I must be rid of the selfishness. How do I do that all through the day? How do I say yes to God, right? Because when we're, we're talking about this third step and, um, you know, that, that, I'm supposed to be one of God's blocks to build with me. My son builds with blocks. Where does God need me in his world today? It's not to build me. It's what can I do to build God's world? You know, and sometimes you get the cool jobs. Sometimes you get to come talk at the thoughts, you know, like that's so cool, right? You know, I love thoughts, by the way, you know, I'm a thoughts girl through and through. Don P was, was my grand sponsor. Love, love thoughts. And, um, you know, that's the cool job. But other days, man, other days, you get the bummer jobs. You know, you really do. You get to be the, you know, the, the, the handle on the john or something fun like that. You know, like it just, but you know what? Everybody needs one. You know, when I moved to Boston, I had to tell you, Boston's the only place I ever said, not there. Don't want to go to Boston. No desire to go to Boston. I grew up in flip-flops with banana trees. Don't want to live in places that it snows. I didn't even own a coat. Okay. When I got sober, I didn't own a coat. I didn't know, you know, like how the heck I got here. Can't even, you know, but here I am. And never did I ever say, gosh, I can't wait to be uniquely useful. Never did I ever wake up and, you know, go and I can't wait to be uniquely useful, but that's my experience. You know, like it has been so incredible to be in a place where I've gotten to, you know, really carry the message and work with so many young, and vibrant, incredible women, you know, who have made me better. You know, the, what I've found is that Alcoholics Anonymous is not a self-help program. And when I first w was learning to pray and meditate back in college, before I was sober, it was all about the alcoholic theme song, me, 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 me. I'm doing this to fix me. Let's be honest. I'll pray and meditate and put my legs behind my head and paddle up the Amazon because I want the effect produced. And I still like the effect produced. I do. But it's not the reason that I do everything. I do the things that I do today because I am willing to take direction. And I'm willing to put you ahead of me. I'm willing to put God ahead of me. Because the truth is, there are days I'd like to sleep in. You know, there are days that I'd love to have the temper tantrum still and say, you know, I don't want to have to. When I first got sober, my sponsor told me, she's like, you can have all the temper tantrums you want out in the parking lot and then you just do it anyway. Right. But what it says later, like I said earlier, is that we absolutely insist on enjoying um, our lives. Once I've been through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, once I've had this spiritual awakening, it is my job to not be a Glen Lott. It is my job to find the pink cloud every day. It is my job. It is my duty to make sure that every single day I am cherishing, you know, the attitude of gratitude we talk about in the rooms. Uh-uh. 
No, you can't have an attitude of gratitude unless you're actually practicing gratitude. Gratitude is a muscle you build. Gratitude, these are spiritual exercises. Steps 10 and 11 are about building muscle. And like we go to the gym and we start lifting our weights, you know, like after my second back surgery, you know, like they gave me half pound weights and I'm looking at this going a half a pound. Come on, really? And they're like, yeah, just, you know, don't strain yourself. I'm like, ah, okay. So, but after I'd started doing the half pound weights, I'm able to do more and more and more. And, you know, that's what, what step 11 has really done for me. It's helped me to develop, oh, wait for it, my willpower, my willpower. You know, I need to dig my heels in and have that spiritual temper tantrum. You know, I'm still as good as the temper tantrum as I ever have been. You bring out any two-year-old or three-year-old and I'll throw them down. I promise you, I can win, you know, but today I am going to stay with God's intention. I am going to be happy, joyous, and free. I am going to hold God's hand because you can't make me do anything that I don't want to do. You can't. You don't have that power anymore. You may have installed my buttons. You know, my family, they installed my, I got a sister, man, a sister of mine. I mean, she is, okay, in the words of Texas, this will cover it all. Bless her heart. You know, like just bless her heart, Okay. There are no words. There are no words. And I love the woman, but I don't like her anymore. You know, I just don't, I don't like playing with mean people, you know, and, and, and she doesn't mean to be mean, you know, I don't think, I don't know, but you know, like she's just selfish and self-centered. She's exactly the way I was. I was so selfish and self-centered that I didn't even see you as I steamrolled you. You know, I don't want to be that girl anymore. I don't, I want to, I want to judge me by my actions and I want to assume love on your part, right? You may hurt me, but I, but I doubt very often people are getting up in the morning and saying, I can't wait to take a course action to hurt her, Lisa. And I felt in the old days, like it was. And when I get up in the morning and I quiet those voices in my mind, and when I really say, okay, God, where do you need me? Where do you need me to go? What do you want me to do? Give me that servant's heart. When I take that, that's the proper attitude and work at it. And I come back. No, this is the God I choose to believe in. This is when I was new, in my first year or so, I found a pair of glasses. They looked a lot like these glasses, except they didn't, they didn't have corrective lenses in it, but they had red lenses in them. And so it made my whole world pink because I knew I needed to see the world differently. It was like there was just mud on my windshield all the time, and I didn't have enough of that spray to get it off. You know, I was seeing you through all of, thank you. I was seeing you through this haze of, of crap all the time, right? And I need to wash that off. I want to see you the way God sees you. I want to see your heart. I want to know that although you may hurt me seemingly without, provocations sometimes that you know you're not out to get me right the only person that has really ever been out to get me has seemed to be me it's me I'm the biggest perpetrator of my life and when I realize as I'm driving down the street right and you cut me off well why did you cut me off right when I remember that it's not what way I see it like there's another story I don't it's not true because I said it it's not true because I think it you know, I get to decide what lens is going to be there. I get to decide if I see love. I get to do those things. And, you know, again, I'll, I'll, this, I'll end with this. You know, being from Texas, I see meditation as it's outlined in the big book like this. I have, a, I have an old dictionary from 1911. It was my grandfather's who died with almost 40 years of sobriety. And in that book, it talks about the definition of meditation being much more along the, the lines of contemplation. And the example it has is that a general meditates his war. If they do this, then we'll do that, right? But if they do that, we'll do this over here. And so it's to really think things through. And it tells me in my book that I can trust my mental faculties with assurance. After all, God gave me my brain to use. And that when I started to realize that, I wasn't so uh, against it anymore, right? I just want to make sure that my spirit is the one picking up this spiritual tool and that I'm not letting that, that brain of mine run me ragged. So, you know, I like to, I like rodeos. Okay. Cause I'm from Texas. Right. And the classic rodeo thing is the old Bronco, right? It's that old boy who's getting up on the wild horse and he's hanging on for dear life. Right. It's his job because back in the day, if you wanted a horse, you had to go out and catch one. 
right? He had to go catch this horse. And it was his job to get up on this horse and hang on for dear life and until he got thrown off. And when he got thrown off, you know what he did, right? He got back up on that horse and he hangs on for dear life until he gets thrown off. And when he gets thrown off, he gets back up again until the horse is willing to be ridden. And then it just becomes a tool. That's my mind. And as I do this each day, as I set my intention, as I plot my course, as I course correct through the day, as I look and see the opportunities that I missed each night, that horse becomes a gentle beast that's willing to take me where I want to go. And it is a blessing and not a curse. And you know, that think, think, think sign is not meant to be upside down. So thank you so much for letting me share with you. And I want to wish you a beautiful night. I'm going to have a beautiful night. I'm not making other plans. I hope you will too. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.